Thank you. 25 years into the bio century, and I don't think anyone could have predicted how far we'd come or how fast. So I'm holding in my hand one of the first bio newsletters ever published. It's dated October 1994. And you open it up and you see the smiling face of eight-year-old Ashanti De Silva. This is the after picture. Ashanti and her father beaming as they testified before Congress about the miracle of science. This is the before picture. Ashanti was never supposed to make it to eight. At age two, she'd been given a death sentence, born with two broken copies of the gene that manufactures a protein called ADA. And without it, her T cells died off and her body couldn't fight disease. Ashanti was diagnosed with severe combined immune deficiency, otherwise known by the bleak acronym SCID. You might remember this as the bubble boy disease. Her crippled immune system made interacting with the world around her an existential threat. Every person she touched, every glass she shared, even the air she breathed were all potential sources of pathogens. And by age four, Ashanti was slipping away. But unbeknownst to Ashanti, the stars were aligning for her. Her physician knew a team of scientists at the NIH. And they were taking the seminal genetic engineering work of Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer, and for the first time, applying it to human health, using viruses as a kind of vector to deliver corrected genes to patients. By the late 1980s, researchers had used this technique to alter the genes of dozens of species of plants and animals. An NIH doctor named French Anderson and his colleagues wanted to show that they could do the same for human beings to correct a defective gene that's critical to health. Well, Ashanti's parents were fighters. They had immigrated to this country in search of a better life. And they sent a pint of their daughter's blood to the NIH on a wing and a prayer. And then the call came. The NIH doctors were looking for someone just like Ashanti, and they wanted a family with a science background parents who could understand what was happening. Well, back in Sri Lanka, her father Raj was a chemical engineer, and her mother Van was a nurse. So that's how, on September 14, 1990, Ashanti De Silva became the first patient in the world to receive gene therapy. And they knew it had worked just a few months after the treatment when the entire De Silva family contracted the flu and the first one to get better was Ashanti. Well, 28 years later, Ashanti remains on enzyme replacement therapy. But for all intents and purposes, she lives a normal, happy life. And my friends, this is the power of biotechnology. <laughs> Three years after Ashanti's treatment, bio was formed. And from the beginning, our core mandate has been to create a policy environment that helps convert medical miracles like hers into accessible therapies that can reach all patients in need. Innovation has been our mission in every policy debate, both here and abroad, at every meeting in the White House and Congress, in every sit down with local officials or foreign leaders. And this was the North Star of my predecessor, Carl Feldbaum, by his first president. He was the former chief of staff to Senator Arlen Specter, and he built this organization from the ground up. And now innovation has been my driving principle for more than 13 years. It's why we changed the I in bio to stand for innovation. We don't just represent an industry, we represent a groundbreaking technology. At bio, we've cultivated allies in Congress to protect the intellectual property framework that makes biotech, nation, biotech innovation possible. Our system is the world's best for supporting tech transfer from university settings into the commercial marketplace. And we help pass the Jobs Act, so pre-revenue pre biotechs have a chance to go public and get the capital they need to take their ideas from the lab to the marketplace. And we've worked to modernize the FDA and accelerate drug development and review while still maintaining the gold standard for safety. 
And under Scott Gottlieb, the FDA has shown an unprecedented willingness to work with the research community to get it right. And so last fall, 28 years after Ashanti Da Silva made history, the FDA has made some of its own. In August, the agency gave an historic green light to the very first commercially approved gene therapy. It's Novartis' CAR-T treatment, a cell-based gene therapy that can modify a patient's own blood cells to attack a deadly form of childhood leukemia that hasn't otherwise responded to any other treatment. And then seven weeks later came a second landmark approval. Gilead, following its acquisition of Kite Pharma, received approval for a CAR-T therapy with the potential to send cancer into remission for thousands of patients with aggressive lymphoma. And then, in December, the FDA approved Spark Therapeutics gene therapy for inherited retinal disease. By correcting a rare genetic defect, this breakthrough treatment can prevent children from going blind. Now, these approvals were the culmination of decades of research and testing. But this is just the beginning. There are another 81 gene therapies and 46 CAR-T medicines in the pipeline, and hundreds more in preclinical development. Nothing can stop the science of biotechnology. Nothing except bad policy. Only one in 10 biotech companies will survive to earn a penny of profit. And investors require a return commensurate with that risk. They just won't invest. So our task now is to work with payers to make next generation medicines affordable without chilling the private sector investment that makes them possible. Because if government dictates the price of the few medicines that do make it to market, the capital our industry depends on will disappear. So we have to mobilize. Margaret Mead once said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Bio is making it easier than ever for you to make your voices heard. If you haven't signed up for bio action yet, take your cell phone out right now. Please, take them out. Power them on, power your phone on. For those of you who have been, who have been texting during my talk, you can skip that step, <laughs> get right to it. But I want you to text bio to 52886. And then, during critical policy debates in Washington or in your state capital, we'll make it easy for you to contact your elected officials so we can mobilize as a community. So again, I want you to text BIO to 52886. Now this, this is the BIO staff. Diversity is our greatest strength. We're here to empower all of you. And last year, BIO launched a diversity initiative to convince our member companies to act on the growing body of evidence linking diverse leadership to better performance. And the BIO board of directors and the BIO staff are committed to leadership diversity throughout our industry. It's time we advance more qualified women, minorities, and LGBT executives. The best of the best should lead us. And this is not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And we need to be smart, and push aside old conceptions, and truly embrace meritocracy, regardless of race, gender, or orientation, because our scientific possibilities have never shown more promise. Our chairman, John Maraginore, will talk about how our industry can open more doors to a new generation of leadership in his fireside chat tomorrow. We believe diversity is essential to drive the next breakthrough scientific advances. Advances like gene editing. Every week, we're seeing new applications for this technology. Bacteria and other organisms already alter their DNA to defend against viruses. And they store part of that virus so they can recognize and attack it if it comes back. And the tools used to do this are called Cas proteins, nature's genetic scissors. CRISPR has been likened to a search and replace function for DNA. But new applications for CRISPR aren't just turning genes off and on, 
They can dial a gene's expression up or down like a dimmer switch. In the agricultural space, gene editing can produce crops that withstand drought and disease or eliminate invasive species. It can produce foods that are more nutritious. Gene editing can also create viral resistance in animals or increase their tolerance for heat in tropical climates. Bill Gates said, gene editing to make crops more abundant and resilient could be a lifesaver on a massive scale. Recombinetics is a Minnesota biotech. They're using genetic editing to breed hornless cows. The huge horns on dairy cows are dangerous. So cows are often dehorned in a process that's costly for the rancher and it's painful for the cow. Well, gene editing can promote humane treatment of livestock by turning off the gene that provides for horns. And when it comes to gene editing and the debate about it, bio will lead. We're working with our elected officials to create a sensible, ethical, regulatory framework, just as we did for stem cell research years ago. Now, we've already scored a major victory with the USDA's decision to treat gene editing in plants as an extension of traditional breeding tools. Industrial biotech companies are using CRISPR too. Now get this, spider silk is an almost mythical material. It's stronger than steel and it's tougher than Kevlar. But you can't farm it because the spiders that produce it have this bad habit of eating one another. Now, biotech companies have searched for years for a way to mass produce spider silk. And now Amsilk a German biotech has found a way using gene editing as part of its toolkit. And it's biocompatible. So Amsilk is working on biomedical applications for synthetic spider silk with the potential for it to be used in everything from sutures to implants and prosthetics. When it comes to human health, gene editing is still in its infancy. Research is underway to treat sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis, congenital blindness, and hemophilia. And the first gene editing clinical trial started last year to treat a rare metabolic disorder known as Hunter syndrome. As an industry, we will continue to champion the evolution of patients as subjects to patients as partners. As partners are the real experts in their conditions. They're following the research. They're clinical pioneers. And they're our real life inspirations. We don't have to wonder what the future looks like because the future is upon us. Now, in case you have any doubt that our industry can transform a death sentence into a fulfilling life that includes love, marriage, a master's degree, and a meaningful career spent giving back, I'd like you to please put your hands together for our special guest whose presence here today proves that the impossible is possible. Please welcome to the bioconvention stage the first gene therapy patient in history, Ashante De Silva. Shante, your story inspires and it motivates us and it gives hope to rare disease patients across the world that their story can have a different ending too. And I know you have a message for them today. Thank you so much, Jim. It's really a pleasure to be here. I just wanted to say um, I have a message for patients and families. To all of you searching for a treatment or a cure in your lifetime, I really hope that you can look at my story and know that anything is possible. Patients and their families are now at the forefront of biomedical research. We're connecting with scientists, we're sharing information, and most importantly, we're telling our own stories. So please, have hope, be your own advocate, and please never give up. Thank you. Ashanti, you've not only made history, you've made a difference for patients around the world. You've connected them with knowledge, resources, and with each other. 
So I want to thank you for making us proud. And it's my honor to present you with our first ever 2018 Bio History Maker Award. Thank you so much, Jane.